Well, little break. I hope you had time to debrief with your uh, colleagues. We have now a very interesting uh, panel and great panelists. But the theme for this session is how can we use both the science that Adam explained so well and the platforms that we heard in the previous session to enhance experience and to enhance cognition. Those are two different outcomes, but we have a huge opportunity for both of them. And we have a great session to discuss real world scenarios in which that's already happening. And given all the controversy about what works, what doesn't work, I want to ask, I will ask the panelists how they are showing to their clients that actually what they are selling is working or how they plan to do so, because that's extremely important for the field to keep growing. Uh, my name, Alvaro Fernandez. I run a company tracking, it's a market research company tracking how neuroscience is being applied to the real world. And I wanted to start the session just by giving you a few very interesting data points. So today we are announcing a new report where we have been tracking thousands of patents of non-invasive neurotechnology because we wanted to preview where innovation is going to come from in the next few years. So this took us over a year of work, and I want to show you a very interesting slide. So this is the red line is overall patents in the US Patent Office. This is normalized. Blue is what we call pervasive neurotechnology. So non-invasive neurotechnologies, non-invasive, so they have no side effects, so they can be available and ubiquitous everywhere. But you can see the huge inflection point in 2010 growing exponentially. So this suggests that even if there is maybe 200, 300 people in this room, we are going to see thousands in years ahead once this IP starts to be developed and it starts to be commercialized. Those are the four main technology classes when we were reviewing all the patents where we saw huge growth in the last uh, couple of years. One is all kind of EEG and quantitative EEG applications. And we ha have heard a few today. I'm sure you will hear many more today and tomorrow. Two are different ways of neuromonitoring, how to monitor the function of the human brain in different ways. We also found a lot of very interesting patents and applications there. The third one, we turn neurocognitive training. So it's different ways to enhance attention, to enhance cognition, to enhance memory, to enhance mindfulness, emotional self-regulation. So that would be also a huge area of growth. And the last one is TMS, TC, TDCS, so transcranial stimulation that until now used to be more, you have to be more careful, more clinical, but this is starting to be surprising investments, like in Think, for example, a startup that a few months ago got, I think it was $13 million from Cosla Ventures and others to commercialize TDCS from a mainstream consumer perspective. So there's a lot of activity uh, in the field, and those are four data points. So we evaluated the value of all these patents. We found over $2 billion, $2 billion worth. At the bottom left, that's very interesting to think about the future of the industry. There used to be a lot of medical applications of non-invasive neurotechnology, but we found many, many new classes of uh, applications that are non-medical. In fact, when we analyzed the IP portfolios of all the companies in the sector, the number one was Nielsen, the consumer research company. They bought Neurofocus, and it's pretty amazing how they are thinking ahead, how EEG and other technologies can be used to improve consumer research, marketing, but also home health health. They are going to have all these panels of people in their houses. They have the systems, maybe not only how they react to ads, but maybe the same platform could be used to monitor their brain health and even to deliver interventions. And that's coming from Nielsen, that people wouldn't think in those terms. So the field truly is about to explode in many, many interesting ways. And this is why this panel is very important. This is the report. There is an infographic, one pager, in the registration, so all of you could have access to the key data points. So this is a very brief overview why this, I think, is super exciting. And now we have an amazing discussion with four great 
panelists to discuss now the real world. So not a big idea of 2020, but where we are right now. And four very different approaches. What we're going to do is ask each of them a few questions, and then we'll open for Q&A, because I think that's, very, um, that's the best way to engage you. So I don't know in what order we should, oh, we should go. Uh, well, maybe why don't we start with uh, Evian, who is next to me. So Evian, can you tell us a bit about uh, your company, and specifically with the point of view of how your platform is trying to enhance experience or ex enhance cognition, how you are trying to do that? So yeah, thanks, Alvaro. Uh, um, essentially, uh, our company, My Brain Solutions, is a uh, platform that assesses, trains, and monitors um, new brain habits. So our, our companies, the, the, our, our market are um, 100 um, name brand uh, US corporates, for many of them Fortune 500 companies, and, um, and addiction clinics. And what they want to know is slightly more than cognition, because there's growing skepticism about the, the generalizability of cognition. So what they want to know is, are people changing their brain habits? So essentially, we, um, the assessment seems to be the means by which people invest in themselves <coughs> to assess their brains. And it seems like once people do that assessment, there's a 30-minute assessment and soon to be a shorter one, they've made that investment, and it seems like that gives them a very increased likelihood that they're going to train a new brain habit. Just to clarify, so you see more interest in corporates or in mental health? Give us one example. Of so the work, corporates yeah. are, are looking for resilience to increase their, their offer to all the employees. Say again. To, um, so for companies like Boeing, Cisco, Nationwide. And they're really interested in increasing the resilience, the adaptability, and the times of adversity of their, of their personnel. Whereas in addiction clinics, they really are interested in growing, in developing a habit, the self-efficacy of being able to have some impulse control and some self-regulation. So really, the proof point, and it is increasingly about proof points, because of course the technologies are marvelous, and we're seeing a wonderful demonstration here of the plethora of growing opportunities to train the brain. So the bottom line to your question is that what they want to see is the extent to which a habit is being formed, and not just people improving in a game or in a, in a cognition score. And what we let them do is, instead of us telling them, we do publish in, in journals like Technology and Innovation, but we let them, we give them quarterly reports so they can see for themselves in a de-identified way the extent to which their own population is adopting, retaining, and changing habits that are ecologically valid to them. And what we're finding is um, as as this whole field is becoming more, more um, kind of known, um, that there's the, this balance between skepticism and, and adoption and retention in ways that it is all about habits. And, and that with a lot of it is depending on the company's ability also to, to, um, to message their clients in a way that help, help them along the way to do so. So we'll talk more about that afterwards, the efficacy and how to prove it works. Chris, why don't you tell us your own company and your own platform to enhance? Uh, and let me also mention to you that your company, Advanced Brain Monitoring, you have invested in very good patents, so you rank pretty highly in the report we're releasing. Great, thank you, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so Advanced Brain Monitoring has been in business now for 16 years. I can't believe it, <laughs> but um, we've been developing and commercializing mobile, scalable, physiological monitoring systems. Um, we span um, the, the sleep domain, so we introduced one of the first in-home um, sleep devices for diagnosing sleep apnea and other sleep disorders, so you don't have to go to a sleep lab anymore. Um, and then we have a whole suite of daytime products um, that in integrate EEG um, up to 24 channels of EEG as, as well as other cardio, respiratory, other parameters that you might want to measure. All of our devices have been FDA cleared, so, so we are a little bit of the odd man out, in, in, but not so much anymore um, in this community. Um, 
So if you're building something medical, a medical application, and you want to employ some sort of physiological monitoring, um, and you want to get it cleared through FDA, we've tried to make our platform as open and available as possible so that all of you can come with your apps, put them on top of our platform, and then let's go back through FDA together, if, if that's your desired path. Um, what we've spent a great deal of, our engineers have spent a great deal of our time working on is, is not just developing the mobile systems and making them comfortable and easy to use, but building software technologies that help us to interpret those physiological signals and turn them into meaningful outputs that can then be used in, in closed-loop environments. So I think Adam set the stage perfectly for, for this concept of closed loop. So very early on, we developed uh, a set of cognitive, global co cognitive state metrics that we validated on hundreds of people. We started with the simple ones, drowsiness, alertness, um, uh, working memory load, um, looking at stress. There we use a combination of ECG, heart rate variability, and, and EEG. And then more recently, we've added some, some layers that include affective, so positive and negative affective metrics, uh, as well as doing kind of all of the more rudimentary or fundamental work where we're looking at um, power spectral densities and wavelet extractions and, and looking now at more advanced mathematical techniques, always with the goal and eye towards, can this be done in a real-time closed-loop environment? So we have a lot of those tools built and what's been incredibly exciting for us is we've had products on the market for a little over five years. We have about 200 university partners and labs who, are, who have been working and building apps. And we're now starting to see products. Um, one product that was recently came out was a, a group called DeServo. They built, they used our system and they built a visual perceptual training um, platform that they're now using to train Major League Baseball players. So uh, they have a Kickstarter, so I should give them a, a plug to Servo. Uh, there's a PhD that came out of Columbia uh, where we worked with Paul Shia's lab. Um, and on the medical side, we are building a number of different applications um, that span autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, number of different disease states. Those are gonna be slower to evolve and come to market. Um, but in the meantime, we're starting to see these, you know, third and fourth generation applications of our products um, becoming real and, and on the market. Um, another, another one that came out this year was for cybersecurity where we were able to use some of our engagement and workload metrics to identify when people sense malware or they look at a fraudulent website, there's a particular neural response to that, even though consciously they may not be aware of that. So now becoming part of a training application where we can train you to use those brain signals to better detect when, you're try when someone's trying to scam you. I know Santos has done some really cool applications too, with some with our systems as well. So we're going right now to Santos, but just one clarification. Are you now selling something straight to a consumer, either yourself or no. some of your partners, or no. this is still we, more business to business? We medical? cannot, as an FDA manufacturer with all of the infrastructure that goes into that, we can't build a consumer device. I mean, we cannot manufacture something inexpensively enough to be a consumer device. Um, we've We've ramped up production and we've done, you know, fairly large scale manufacturing so that we can bring our prices down and sell medical grade systems at, for, you know, for researchers. So we've made them affordable, um, but they're not really consumer devices. Now, that doesn't mean that someone couldn't build a platform and an integration and then hand it off to another manufacturer and do a consumer device. It's just not in our wheelhouse. Um, Excellent. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Next, we have Santos at Honeywell Labs, and he wanted to show you one slide. But why don't you start telling us yeah, sure. about what you're working on, and then let's see. So I'm part of uh, Honeywell Aerospace, and we make um, flight decks for 
uh, Boeing and Airbus airplanes. Um, and in these systems, it's a tremendous amount of automation, but the human still plays a central role in them. And so a big focus of our organization has been on ways to sense human cognitive capacity and to, to do things to measure uh, the impact of systems on, on users. So we've been involved in a research effort funded by IARPA uh, where we're trying to um, enhance reasoning and problem solving ability among healthy adults. And we're doing this um, in collaboration with uh, researchers at uh, Harvard Medical School, Oxford University, Northeastern University, and a game development company called uh, SimCoach Games, a spin-off from Carnegie Mellon uh, that's helped us develop a, a cognitive training game. So we're using a combination of cognitive training, uh, carefully designed, and I'll talk about in just a second, combined with uh, transcranial electrical stimulation to try to enhance reasoning and, and problem-solving abilities. So our, our intervention on the training side tries to look at some of the gaps and some of the most prominent uh, work that's out there in the area of cognitive enhancement. And one of the, the limitations we're trying to address is this uh, focus on, on training contexts that may not be ideal in terms of uh, generalization. Uh, so for instance, you know, the results with the dual end back task that show some promise, but you know, people are spending a long amount of time <clears throat> where difficulty may be varied but it's still a single context in which you're, you're gen, you know, developing proficiency. What we're trying to do is to address all three process components of executive function, uh, update, uh, inhibit, switch, combining them in various ways, but also including mental operations such as logical operations, uh, arithmetic operations, uh, uh, relational operations, uh, and also applying them in, in a variety of different uh, cognitive domains, visual, numeric, et cetera. And so these combinations create a very rich but systematically mappable space uh, within which a, a game or some kind of cognitive activity can occur. Um, and we also, as people are training, vary the, the training every three, three minutes or so. So you're repeating, you're applying these skills in a variety of, uh, of different contexts. And we've embedded our game uh, in the context of uh, 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 framing a story called Robot Factory. Uh, they already uh, so saw the slide a minute ago. Okay. I don't know if All you right. can so, come back, but yeah. So basically, mm -hmm. you're, you're an entry-level worker at a robot factory set in a dystopian future, and there's a character called BossBot who's uh, monitoring your work. And BossBot gives you complicated instructions every few, few minutes that you try to, uh, try he's, to follow. He's back on. Yeah. Yep. And as the game progresses, BossBot becomes more and more demented and, and, and starts giving you very complicated instructions that you know, end up matching uh, your evolving ability. Uh, but there's this narrative to this that, that carries you along, that uh, provides affordances that make uh, otherwise complicated and abstract uh, tasks quite, uh, quite logical and, and easy, to, easy to follow. Um, so there, there are all kinds of psychometrics built into the game. Uh, we have uh, parameters such as uh, the stop signal delay associated with the inhibit function that's carefully tailored to each individual. Uh, we have a uh, partial order uh, graphical network underlying the, the system uh, that, a, that uses past statistical data to rank these very different shifts, as we call them, or micro games that are embedded here in terms of relative difficulty. So we can have an individualized trajectory uh, through the game uh, that's incorporated here. Uh, we're also coupling all of this with transcranial electrical stimulation, where we're um, comparing random noise stimulation with TDCS uh, and trying to see what the combination of all of this is. Um, so we we're, we're currently uh, have kicked off a, a large study uh, that involves all four institutions that I mentioned, um, Honeywell, um, Harvard Medical School, Northeastern University. Uh, and and uh, at these locations, we're running about uh, 440 subjects over a span of three weeks of cognitive training with the game, uh, different kinds of uh, transcranial electrical stimulation. Uh, important characteristic is that we're also including um, an active control uh, condition, uh, so placebo control condition, comparing all of this to sham stimulation as well. Um, we've uh, pre-published our, our research or pre-registered it uh, under the open science framework, so our hypotheses, analyses approach are all available, um, it kind of uh, constrains the interpretation of the data once we, uh, once we uh, finally collect it all. 
let me ask you a question before we move to Daniel. Uh -huh. um, so what's the scenario of use for what you are developing, and how are you planning, or what's the thinking of combining the training side with the tra transcranial stimulation, like in a sequential manner at the same time? Tell oh, us it's briefly. at the same time. Okay. So yeah. as, you, as you're playing the game, yeah. um, the system automatically launches uh, these different forms of stimulation that we're exploring. And so the idea is that you're playing the game, but the underlying neural substrate that the game engages is enhanced by uh, the stimulation that's being used. OK, excellent. Why don't we move to Daniel, and then we can come back to many other questions that are coming already from this discussion. Daniel, why do you tell us about your work in this yeah. area? Um, so first of all, thank you. And thank you to Zach and the conference organizers for having me here. Um, so I am the uh, CEO of Halo Neuroscience. We've been in operation for about two years now, and we're just based down the street uh, here in San Francisco. Um, we are building a um, wearable neurostimulation platform system. Um, I can't say too much about the product right now because we're still in stealth mode, but um, maybe we can rewind a little bit and just um, I could talk a little bit about my background and the inspiration for the project. Um, so I come from the world of invasive brain stimulators. Um, my last company was a company called Neuropace, which brought to the world the first closed loop brain stimulator. Uh, we received FDA approval um, for, uh, for the treatment of epilepsy in 2013. But that was really the, the product of a 10 year, $250 million raise um, effort. Um, we ultimately got it to the finish line in, um, in uh, a unanimous approval for FDA, um, uh, for, for FDA approval, and that was, uh, I think, a, a mark in history that I will never forget, and especially being a part of it, that, um, that uh, one, it underscores the power of using a medical device to treat the brain. Um, this is very different from the drug approach, where a drug is um, introduced into the blood, and the molecule basically relies on chemistry to go where it needs to go. Um, it often goes to places where it shouldn't go. And so if you show me any drug that primarily affects the brain, um, it's easy to find a dozen side effects that sort of limit its ultimate um, utilization. I've always been fascinated by a device approach where you can be more precise with the delivery of the energy, not only spatially, but temporally. A Neuropace is a great example for that. Um, we, it, it, so this is my last company. The, um, the, the system involves implanting electrodes where the seizures occur. The device is constantly listening to the brain and can predict when a seizure is about to happen, but before it clinically manifests. Um, a tiny electrical impulse goes, uh, is delivered to the brain when it senses that something is wrong and it thereby normalizes brain activity. So that loop happens on the order of a couple of hundred to 2,000 times a day without the patient knowing anything. The only thing they feel is that they have less seizures. In some cases, no seizures at all. Um, one thing, so my co-founder at Halo is a longtime colleague of mine from Neuropace, and one thing that we've always been um, sort of frustrated by is that um, this field of neurostimulation is this $10 billion industry that nobody's ever heard of. And the reason for that is because, um, by and large, um, sales in this industry is dominated by implanted products. Um, and there's sort of a, a, a natural limitation in the adoption of these products because of the surgery. I had thought that industry had gotten lazy, that we could do better, that we could deliver for energy from the outside with a non-invasive product that didn't involve um, um, a pretty invasive surgical procedure. So that was sort of the general inspiration behind Halo. Um, my co-founder and I began reading papers about different non-invasive technologies. This is dating back to, we kind of did um, some historical email searching and we exchanged our first emails on um, this topic in 2005. So we've been at this for a while. Um, only recently did we feel that the field had gotten mature enough for us to um, um, take the science that we credit uh, various university labs for pioneering um, out into a commercial organization. So, um, so enter HALO. We raised um, uh, uh, money from a, a list of Silicon Valley uh, VCs. Um, we've been, um, like I said, we've been around for about two years now. 
And uh, I look forward to telling you more about the company um, later this year, where we can be a little bit more public about what we're doing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. We have a good sense now of what you are doing, why. Big, big problem in the industry is this efficacy problem. And a lot of controversies at a very superficial level because of maybe the Nintendo brain game or a few years ago, very commercially successful, questionable claims. But in each of your scenarios, how do you show to your clients or to the influencers that it works for whatever it is intended to do? And second, what, if any, is the role of the FDA? A couple of you mentioned the FDA, given the claims you are making. If you are trying to sell something to a company to improve productivity and resilience, I don't think the company will care about FDA. In fact, probably that's the opposite of what they want to hear. So each of you, can you tell us how you prove, how you show it works? So in our case, we were lucky to have a European biotech fund uh, a study for the first brain test, to our knowledge, in psychiatry that is scalable, that can predict who is likely and not likely to respond to the main antidepressives. So that took us <clears throat> 1,800 patients and a $20 million study, 30 sites, 40,000 analyses. <clears throat> it's just been published and it's currently at the final phase of the FDA. But what they, taught that, what they taught us is that for groups like addiction, they do want to know what would be the limits of what we, the sort of level of evidence that we have to show that would be acceptable to the FDA. Because for many of the 12,000 clinics in the United States that treat people with addiction, um, more than half of them are, have a medication base, and they, they do want, there is going to be some FDA issue involved. So that's, that's been a great learning curve for us. Now, what it's taught us is that you don't need a $20 million study and all of that gastric lining loss and massive numbers of teams to generate that. I mean, this just happens to be a first, so, it, so it, was, it was kind of a little bit more onerous. But that we saw that cognition, for example, alone on an online assessment in our CES can be very helpful in predicting in people with addiction who is likely to actually do better. People who have cognitive deficits are actually obviously going to be less likely to do better. You can identify the impulse control, the self-regulation issues. If people, you know, the, it's, it's now thanks to Nora Volko and NIDA, we know that addiction is a brain disease. Um, and so that's just one example. We have equivalent examples for depression, for ADHD, and for other disorders. So the bottom line is that even as something as basic as an online assessment can, um, with some um, rudimentary publication, and it all needs to be published, help people get a grounding about the way they can interpret how to personalize programs, and then do we have a, a suite of 30 sets of training sets that they can train stress reduction, cognitive behavior therapy gamified, and other sort of more traditional sort of games of emotion and thinking, and then they can see the outcomes for themselves. So just to clarify, you mean that if the user has an assessment that is objective and credible, that empowers them to see for themselves exactly. if that's creating value or not? Yeah, and we've got the, the context? exactly, and we've got the confidence to know that the ultimate bar is the FDA, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not for the faint-hearted, and it's certainly <clears throat> been an incredible learning curve for us. And, and being at that final stage is fascinating. But have it published is good, so we can show them that publication, and then say to them, "You can judge for yourself now, in terms of at what point is it credible for you." And it's all now about, I, I think, self-empowerment of the people who run the clinics, self-empowerment of the users, because a lot of this is about trust when it comes to the brain, that, they not, that it's not just a practice effect, that there are some generalizabilities, and that proof points are everything. And so we're increasingly setting up the platform to be a self-efficacy platform. What about companies? Because that's one very interesting use of your platform. When companies like Cisco or Accenture or other large employers are using this, what are they looking for and how do they value, so then, evaluate their <coughs> That's impact? a great question. Uh, the difference between addiction companies and uh, the big, uh, the 50 companies that now use us is that um, in addiction companies, they want to know medically, you know, how is this helping impulse control? In the companies, I'll just give one example in the, in the, in the interest of time. Say Cisco, I personally believe um, that, and, or CERN, I'll let's take CERN. I personally believe CERN is the game changer for wellness in this country because of one person, David Null, the chief medical officer of CERN, who runs lots of studies on wellness and of, so he has personally taken my brain solutions, run studies within CERN, and decided that there are big benefits for people with stress. He's got medical cost claims that he's found, and so we leave it to them 
to then go, and he's presenting that data at the National Business Group on Health in Washington in June. So we increasingly we just sort of suppliers for the big distributors to determine for themselves, MRSA, Aetna, Cerner. So we're really at the mercy of the quality of the science to then be distributed by these companies that really control the show and then let them decide. And David Nill's one example where they've made their own decisions and they then looking at the evidence and seeing that there's no monopoly of wisdom from any company and any product that we've seen, but they're finding who it does apply to, under what circumstances, and what's the level of evidence you can claim, um, and what extent of benefit. So where's the ROI? So bottom line, corporates, it's about the ROI, yep. whereas in addiction, it's about, seriously, how's this going to help? How's it going to help a new brain? Thank habit? you. This is a great overview of two very different scenarios of use and what matters in each. Chris, how would you characterize how? Sure. Well, I, you know, a lot of the, the studies that you do for an FDA submission are about safety and efficacy. And you know, essentially, you just need a large enough population that you test your system and your algorithms on. Um, and you do want to make sure that you scope that population wisely um, so that you, you know, can get your outcomes with statistical significance. That's really critical with all of these tools, that you have fairly large populations. Um, on the flip side of that, when you, you know, that mode of, which is a very traditional mode of, of science, is, you know, population studies, sensitivity, specificity, you know, outcome measures, um, you miss, I think, the most important piece of information that Adam alluded to in his presentation is that there, what we really need to be thinking about to get to the next generation is personalized. Each brain is unique. And even if you've now put me into a, a population of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, with, even within those categories, there are many, many subtypes. And, and we know now we have enough data and literature longitudinally to know that all of these disease states evolve over time and in, it, with different trajectories. So what we really need for the future of healthcare is a personalized profile of each of our brains. So you can envision in the future that you will have a, a sleep profile and, and a brain profile that ho hopefully um, will be part of your medical and healthcare record. So whether that's an EEG or a, a PET scan or uh, an MEG or, you know, obviously we you know, all of these things have different pieces of information for different costs and different investments. But that profile then is something that you will want to be able to manipulate and adjust over time. So developmentally and, and into aging, there's many things we know now about sleep and how important sleep is for health and brain health in particular, and we're starting to be able to manipulate different aspects of sleep to enhance memory, to enhance creativity, to uh, improve overall wellness. And the same, you know, as we're talking about all of these potentials for closed loops, you could have TDCS, uh, but what, when I want to deliver TDCS, I would like to know exactly when my brain needs TDCS and where I'm going to deliver it to and what type of gaming environment I should be in to stimulate that network appropriately, but again, on an individualized basis. And that is somewhat of the flaw in traditional science and medicine is that we put people in populations and we look for statistical significance and, and um, what we really need to think about is an individual brain. And I, I know that's challenging. You, how are you doing that? Are you trying? You have a platform. Are yes. you offering the ability at the individual level or the distributors to show yes, some individual? Yes, absolutely. So, so you can say, you know, uh, we know in general that if you increase your temporal parietal alpha activity, I mean, this is a study that we did on 300 people, that you can improve your marksmanship performance. So, we, I mean, we have tidbits of, of pieces of information like that already um, for motor skill learning or for memory training. You're talking about the NBACT has been used for 
25 years, we know quite a bit about what goes on in the brain when you're doing an NBAC task and how that changes as a function of normal aging and, and you know, progression towards dementia. Now we can start to introduce these interventions, whether it's in a gaming environment, just you know, through interacting with the game, uh, or through stimulation, you know, electroceuticals, we're gonna you know, see very dramatic changes that can be induced, but systematically in a closed loop fashion so that once I introduce that, I know what I'm changing and I know I'm going in the direction that I want to go. And, and there's, there's pieces of information from many different disciplines and fields that I think we can start now to merge together and really build you know, tools and environments for uh, you know, not just wellness, but also for starting to tackle some of these bigger questions, disease questions. Well, Evian years ago coined the term the integrative neuroscience, and I think that's very mm -hmm. exactly what we need, right? Not only silos, but how to integrate it, and not only with each other, but with real world outcomes, with real yes. world things that matter. Yes. So why don't we move now to Santos, and you can tell us, so who is the end use, the end user scenario for what you show us? And how do you plan to prove that it works in that context? Is this, you think, more a military application? Are you doing something from the military corporate perspective? Or tell us more about the benefit and how to measure it. Right, so the intended audience is fairly broad. It's um, you know, healthy adults, 18 to 65 is sort of the, uh, the group that we're looking at. And the idea is to improve you know, kind of general reasoning and problem solving ability that are relevant to our daily work. So the applicability of it is very broad, and that's where it's important in the assessment of it, we again try to capture that breadth, uh, which is why we have four sites where we are conducting this work, uh, including an overseas site. So we have Oxford, two sites in Boston, one in Minneapolis, recruiting broadly. Our, our users, our players, are anywhere from 18 to, to 65. Um, and so you know, there's, there's diversity there so that you know, the findings that come from this are broadly applicable. We're also using a variety of measures, so uh, looking at fluid intelligence scores, um, a variety of them, to be able to see whether the intervention is, is being effective. But that's an important indicator of whether the intervention has succeeded, but we also want to get at the mechanisms that are contributing to that improvement. And so in all our studies, we're collecting a lot of neuro neurophysiological data, uh, fMRI, resting state EEG, to show changes in both structural as well as uh, functional connectivity that result from the, from the training. We're also collecting detailed uh, neurometrics, physiological measures during gameplay and during executive function and um, some of the fluid intelligence tests at the beginning at the end. This is to try to identify neuromarkers and to be able to um, characterize how they change. So neural markers associated with uh, some of the executive functions, for instance. Um, so looking at read readiness potentials in the con context of um, uh, the switch task, or looking at N2 potentials in the context of inhibit. And to have a very detailed trace of how these uh, underlying processes contribute to the, to the changes that occur. Now what surprises me from what you're saying is that it still seems very much in the brain mental space, not so much into the promotion, career development. Mm -hmm. Can you prove, or are you trying to prove that this training can make this person more quickly to learn, to, perf to have higher performance scores, and therefore be faster to be promoted to the next phase? What are the HR measures? Because in the context of uh, corporations, that's what they are going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. They don't care about free intelligence, they will care about will they learn faster, be promoted faster, add more value. Are you trying to add some of those metrics to your studies? Yeah, so not in this particular study, but that's a very important aspect of all of this, right? Because if you could, you could change fluid intelligence scores, and that's, that's great, that's promising. But ultimately, do you become more creative at work? Are you able to handle more? Are you able to solve more complex problems? And, and that's you know, going to come from follow-up work, um, assuming you know, this initial work is, is promising. Um, but you know, we've tried to maximize our chances of that by having a very theoretically inspired game that gets at fundamental processes that we think are relevant, both in this, in the context of the game, but also in everyday, everyday life. Um, but Bruce Wexler's talk yesterday was a nice example of how you could couple some of this basic work with also seeing does it have an impact on the everyday lives of students. Yeah, 
So that's a good model for this kind of work. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And Daniel, and probably you cannot tell us the details of the here and now, what you are doing, obviously, but let's think the five years from now. No, I mean, how, the system, how do you think you could prove so it is working? Yeah, so I, I, I could talk a little bit about the research that we do um, and how we try to show uh, improvement. Um, and I think we try not to be fancy here. Um, we do, it, so these are company run trials, so um, take it with a grain of salt, but we do everything that we can um, to do rigorous scientific research that um, would be appropriate even at a university setting. So we use validated neuro, um, neuropsych metrics like the three back and fluid intelligence testing and things like that. Um, you know, we try not to be fancy there. We try to borrow from science and use university validated um, scientific metrics for measuring. Um, another thing that we do is, um, you know, we have a really strong sham. We ask everybody at the end um, when they leave our facility to guess their group. And so far they're 53% successful. So we're really happy about our sham. Um, uh, we're also able to uh, not only double blind, but triple blind. So um, the subject doesn't know, we don't know, not even our statistician knows until the very end where we do you know, what we call lift the blind. Um, and you know, we could unveil you know, which line corresponds to which group. So um, you know, it's th these types of, um, I guess, just bread and butter um, um, things that folks just sort of take for granted um, that are done at a, a university. I, you know, a company can certainly adopt those principles and run um, rigorous research trials that way. Um, and I think just taking a step back and looking at our field, um, you know, let's face it, uh, we don't have great biomarkers. We can't draw blood and say, oh, your hemoglobin went up and therefore this happened. Or um, I guess to some extent we can use neuroimaging. But, um, you know, those machines are cumbersome and expensive. Um, so uh, for practical reasons, it's, it's difficult to use. Um, so, uh, you know, the only way to get around, um, you know, these metrics that we have that are fundamentally noisy in, in, in its, in its um, output, you know, compared to a biomarker is N. It's refreshing to hear um, that there's uh, multi-center studies that have 400 subjects now. Um, um, it's uh, studies like that that we need more of. Um, you know, in my field, a big study is like 10 in a group, 15 in a group. We can do a lot better than that. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I, I hope Halo could be on the forefront of that effort, and I, I, I look forward to um, university-based research to, to kind of go in that direction where we can just have um, larger sample sizes in each one of the groups. Excellent. Well, I think that's an opportunity probably for many people in the audience developing games. Those games with millions of people could be used on assessments, right? That they could be used to, imp to see people could see themselves if there's any impact in any of these interventions. So it's going to be interesting to see the ecosystem, how it develops, who produces interventions, who produces assessments, what kind of assessments, who buys what. But clearly, this is a whole new domain. And now we just have time for uh, two or three questions. So uh, someone must have a mic somewhere, and there must be a way for anyone in the audience to raise your hand, and then the person on the mic will magically get uh, to you. So I don't know. Yeah, so I think there's already a question there in the back. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I'm Steve Potter from Georgia Tech. Um, you talked about a lot of futuristic technology for brain stimulation. I'm wondering if any of you are looking into optogenetics. If you go to the neuroscience conference, that's really what everybody's working on in research, but I haven't seen it uh, going into, certainly not the clinical world, still non-human primates, I imagine, uh, but it's going to be in gaming at some point. When is that? <laughs> Well, I, from a general perspective, that's a great question. I think from this conference 10 years from now, if not later, I haven't, I don't know, you can tell me more if there's any particular use, but I haven't seen any real world uh, development that I'm aware of right now. Well, it seems to, we to apply research, but we have four amazing guys at the forefront. Maybe you can, you can better answer if you know something specific. Oh, sure. I, I mean, a, as a company, it's difficult for me to justify uh, sort of going into that sort of really deep basic science level of research, our research needs to be more applied. Um, I, I would love to see DNAH or some other 
funding agency um, fuel the research because I think it would be hugely beneficial to the field if we understood it at that level. So <clears throat> I should mention that we are collecting uh, genetic data as part of uh, our studies at some of the sites. So the idea is to better characterize who might benefit from our intervention and try to understand the, the, the factors a, a little better uh, to be able to stratify uh, in terms of uh, the overall population who's likely to, uh, to derive benefits. So, so we are uh, collecting that data and uh, we'll be looking at it at the, the end of the study. See, it's a great question. Um, um, we, we run probably the world's biggest brain database of integrative and standardized measures. We, we looked at 1,500 twins where we measured all these measures and, and I suppose we just really looking at the impact of genetics on things that really do matter in, in terms of creating new habits. So just for example, you know, anxiety is like 80% heritable, or, but I'll just give you one more explicit example. Negativity bias, which as you all know is a key factor underpinning depression, which is sort of a hugely magnified negativity bias. Threat is magnified hugely out of proportion. So being able to have that genetic elucidation at a personalized level really will help shape the specific game intervention. And we're talking about very interesting technologies here, whether it's brain stimulation of various kinds. So there could be, it could help hugely in being able to titrate the best combination of technologies that are also informed partially by the genetics. Genetics are not our destiny, of course, but we ignore them at our peril. Um, because they really, some of them, like negativity bias, for example, have, um, have very, very strong um, characteristics. So this twin study has been a real, real opener for us. And we started putting half the twins on, on our, our, our brain training. We have the, these 30 brain training exercises. One twin goes on, the other doesn't, and then we switch so we can start seeing uh, what the specific impacts are. So it's a great question, and it's, it's a very powerful way of seeing specifically what factors contribute at a personalized level to when people do really create new brain habits, when they partially do and when they don't. I have time maybe for just one final question. Zach, we have one time. Excellent, so one more. Hi, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the, uh, the panel. My question is, so we are interested, um, as a professor in developmental psychopathology, we're interested in changing children's emotional health and well-being through games, and one of the things that we're finding is that as we run our randomized control trials, and from the beginning to the end, it takes about five years to get you know, the publication out, the technology is changing so dramatically that it almost is irrelevant, the, you know, the game that we've initially started to test. And so I'm wondering how you all think about this challenge as the technological landscape changes, as we hear so rapidly, how do you run rigorous uh, trials and still be able to keep up with what matters to kids or adults in this area? I would like to make a quick comment and then you will answer. But what is very interesting is for education perspective, there is a database called What Works Clearinghouse that is run by the Department of Education to see the clinical validation of all educational products. And I'm sure that if you go to any school today and see what they do in a typical day, less than 1% of the interventions or the curriculum of anything will be in that what works clearinghouse database. So many things in the real world, education, even wellness, corporate training, don't have the clinical trials, which is why I think it's very interesting to think how to even avoid that whole process of five years. So that's great for some things, for the FDA, for medical interventions, for education, I'm not sure I would suggest you go that way. And these companies, like I think PIC is going to talk later about their collaboration, big data, and Lumos Labs has been doing something similar, trying to run big studies with 70,000, 80,000 students, and it's not randomized, randomized controlled trials, but that's where I see there's a huge opportunity to leverage all the technology that is becoming available to accelerate development and real world impact. And I think that's going to be enough for many, many applications of course, not all of them, and one has to be careful with what claims you are making. Having said that... Mm. That's a great question. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, in our particular approach, we standardise the methodology of what we do. So this, it's totally standardised and, and integrative. So yes, things do change, but if you keep the core cognitive competencies and the basic assessments the same, 
you have what I think is, is, is part of the future in terms of credibility. The one is the proof point, but the other is the comparative effectiveness. If you don't keep some, something stable, it's very hard to compare what the relative benefits are. So that's a trade-off that, we find all the, that we're trying to find all the time. But we're one of those groups that keep a core of what we're doing completely standardized in terms of, of what we actually assess and how we assess it. Any other? Uh, it's a huge problem from a regulatory standpoint, too, because every nuance change that you make to your platform, uh, even though it may greatly enhance the platform, has to go back through regulatory again. So what you try to do is when you're designing something, try as best as you can to anticipate what will be the future developments and how will this product evolve and try to make your, at least your initial regulatory submission as broad as possible so that then you can easily add those functions and tools. But we're always going, I mean, we're, we're already, you know, our technology has advanced rapidly while our, here's our cleared technology and here's the kinds of things that we're doing today, eventually we'll wrap that back around and, and get it cleared for medical applications. But you can do quite a bit in the, in the research domain where as long as you have you know, IRB approval, you can use all these devices, build you know, second and third generation, and then go back and, and get it cleared. Um, and that's, that you have to operate that way because innovation you know, between electronics, sensors, and um, definitely algorithms and processing capabilities are moving at light speed compared to medical devices. That's the nature of the business. But you really want to try to envision what, you know, what are the innovators doing and how can I envision that going into my product and improving my product down the line and come up with a, you know, a five or 10 year plan. And I think that's a great way to wrap up the session. Please, everyone, let's thank the great panelists who joined us. Mm -hmm. <laughs>